In an interview with Variety, Markiplier was asked about the FNAF movie, and implied quite heavily that he will be making an appearance, saying, quote, Everyone wants to know. There was a lot of confusion. Yeah, I can't say anything particular about that. There was a lot of scheduling conflict, and I can't say anything. Which was his way of saying that he's at least making a cameo, because why, why else would there be scheduling conflicts if he didn't need to have free time for this? You know, like if he wasn't in the movie, he wouldn't have had any schedule conflicts because there wouldn't be anything to conflict with. You know what I'm saying? And given a number later on this list, it's entirely possible that there are even more cameos than we were expecting. More on that later, guess you're gonna have to stick around. And at 9, Young Vanessa. Now, last time I mentioned that one of the interesting things about the casting choices is that someone has been cast as Vanessa. Yeah, interestingly enough, there is a Vanessa character on the cast list, despite the Vanessa we know not being introduced until Security Breach, where she seems to be in her early 20s. And considering how Security Breach takes place after FNAF 6, which takes place post-2023 at least, it shouldn't be the same Vanessa in this movie, unless it's like a robot situation like in the novels, but nevertheless, there is a Vanessa in this film. But now, it seems that there has been a casting call for a young Vanessa as well, meaning that the idea that this is a robot Elizabeth, but like the adult version, is less likely. However, it's entirely possible that the young Vanessa is just a younger version of one of the robots, like, again, a fourth closet situation where there's multiple. So. We won't really know until the movie comes out. And also, if you're excited for the FNAF movie, be sure you hit subscribe, because we're going to be covering it as much as we can, all right? Maybe we'll even do some one-off videos here and there, saying like, hey, here's something that happened. And at 8, Victoria Patnod. While there haven't been really many major reveals since the last video, there have been quite a few casting announcements. One of these is Victoria Patnod, I hope I'm saying that right, as currently a unnamed social worker. And this seems like a likely stand-in for a social worker who's assigned to Michael after Crying Child dies, as basically the therapist who tries to help him forgive himself and move on with his life. Or that was just like their way of like avoiding sending him to jail for manslaughter. This could be the case, and honestly I think that it is the most likely scenario, but I think that she could have more significance than that as well. I mean like, if this is meant to be the first three games in the movie, Michael is going going to need a reason to start working against his father, and a social worker that his father was paying for in an effort to keep him from the truth that Mike then revisits after he snaps for the first time in a decade with the fountain fight. Then that social worker revealing everything about his father could be quite the compelling narrative. In at 7, Monty. Okay, now, originally, we thought that this movie was going to be the first game. Like, the first movie. But then, like I said, I saw tweets saying that it was going to be the first three. But then, after we got the tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop with the photos of Springtrap said, it kind of became clear that Springtrap's going to be in the movie. However, it's also worth noting that there is another head in the background of the last image of that post's collage that seems to be extremely similar to Monty after he's been broken in Security Breach. But considering how, again, Security Breach takes place decades after FNAF 3. It's unlikely that he'll appear in this movie, but maybe in the third one that they have planned, considering how Matthew Lillard signed a contract for three films. So, I don't know, maybe they're already working on the other props. Uh, this could also just simply be a, a remaining thing from another project, because Jim Henson's has worked with, like, reptile exhibits and stuff and zoos, so could just be that. And at six, Foxy. Fritz is one of the original five missing children, being the victim who possesses everyone's favorite animatronic, Foxy. I guess in a way it was kind of meant to be, given that both of their names start with F and are shorter than the other names of their groups. And the others actually have similar names to their animatronics as well. Gabriel has the same amount of letters as Fazbear. Jeremy has the same amount of letters as Bonnie. Susie and Chica have the same amount of letters too. And like, come on, that's freaking weird, man. <laughs> but. After that, not much else is known about Fritz. There originally was a theory that Fritz and Foxy were a good guy who actually wanted to help the player in FNAF 1, but that was debunked in Custom Night after an April Fool's update where Foxy's mechanics were changed to instead block one of the doors instead of just kill you. It was proven to be a joke feature since the other mechanics that were changed in this update had Phone Guy and Springtrap being connected, referencing the Phone Guy's Purple Guy theory, and Dream Theory, which again, we now know is not true. But considering how Asher Colton Spence has been officially cast in the 
the movie, I think that that kid looks like a Fritz. All right, the orange hair for the most orange of the animatronics, it makes sense to me, okay? Tell me that that kid doesn't look like a Fritz. He certainly looks more like a Fritz than a Gabriel or a Jeremy. Just saying. Happy to do in a number five security guard experience. In the mall set, there were photos of the ice cream shop that were released or leaked, which whichever one you kind of want to take it as. But some people think that that was Mike's job before security. However, I think that mall security to night guard at Freddy's makes more sense than ice cream shop to security guard to night guard. It just seems like a more basic progression, you know? Like it's not Ant Man. Mike isn't gonna work at Ben and Jerry's and then don a springlock suit and become a superhero fighting crime, okay? The name of the ice cream shop is also Ice Cream Parties, and it could still be a Chica themed joint, so. Yeah, it, it's either that the pizza plex is Chica's party world, or maybe it's just the ice cream shop That's the party world. It's not really anything deeper than that. Um, but yeah it, Mike was a security guard before starting at Freddy's So it actually makes more sense as to why they would have hired Michael because he actually had security experience Which also might explain why the higher-ups were apprehensive to making Vanessa a night guard at the mega pizza plex Because you know they've had people who had experience before which would mean that Mike had worked security for a bit building the size of the pizza plex before, which would make sense if he was working security for this one, but yeah. And in four, missing children. The missing children's incident is the inciting moment for the entire FNAF series. Without the missing children's incident, we never would have gotten the first game, which means that we're expecting to see something similar in the movie, albeit a little more tame, I'm sure, since it's probably going to be rated PG-13. But we know that there is going to be a 1980s crime scene thanks to a casting call found on Central Casting searching for both adults and children in the scene. And I mean, like, out of everything we know in the series, it's most likely that the missing children's incident is the scene rather than, like, a bite of 87 or a crying child death scene. Because, you know, I don't really think those would be classified as crime scenes, but a guy stabbing people? Yeah, that that's more of a crime. And thanks to the Fast Bear Frights books, we know that the incident takes place in 1985, and this kind of confirms that. I hope Oscar like pops out of a ball pit real quick though, and it's like, yo, what's up? And then like goes back in and does the whole Big Bang Theory thing where he's like, <gasps> Bazinga. Getting close to the end in the number three, multiverse. Thanks to an interview with Matthew Lillard, who plays William Afton in the movie, we know that he actually signed a three-picture deal with Blumhouse with regards to the FNAF movie series. So, it's very possible that we get upwards of two sequels at the very least, which also makes sense if you look at it in like multiple ways. From like a film production and marketing standpoint, trilogies have been a staple of movies for decades. Several franchises always come out with trilogies, like Star Wars, Diver Virgin, the Marvel superheroes all get their own trilogies, not including team up movies. Christopher Nolan's Batman, Sam Raimi's Spider Man, the list goes on. So, yeah, a trilogy of FNAF movies would not be out of the ordinary, especially if the first one does well. Because, I mean, like, come on, a Sonic King Canada sequel out of everything and over Detective Pikachu, I'm sure FNAF is going to get one. There's also the point that, from what I've seen at least, it's possible this movie is going to be the first three, like I was explaining earlier, which would really make Makes sense because then you have three movies that are three games each for a total of the nine full games that have been released to this point. Add on to that the Fazbear Fanverse that has now starting to be released a little bit with FNAF Plus I think. I think FNAF Plus is out at least or at least it's going to be out soon and Pop goes. So yeah we could have a whole FCU going on which would be pretty sick considering the recent takes on Marvel movies and how Winnie the Pooh got a horror version now that it's in the public domain. But ultimately in Number two, fired. Leaked on set footage, or possibly just set footage, depending on your definition of leaked, shows a scene where Mike is punching someone in a fountain. Or at the very least, he was punching the water that was in the fountain, since the camera angle didn't really make the second actor necessary. But nevertheless, we know that there is going to be a fight in a fountain in what looks to be most like a mall. This probably takes place closer to the beginning of the movie, and probably is the catalyst for Mike needing to find a new job, which would then bring him to Freddy Fazbear's, but that's currently speculation. It's also been reported that this scene is caused by someone tackling Mike into the fountain or the other way around. I can't really remember which one it was. While a child does scream 
for their dad or at their dad, which is probably the one that Mike is beating to a pulp. So yeah, my guess is that like this kid and his father were arguing or that the child wasn't listening and then the dad was getting angry. So Mike, due to his trauma from the bite of 83, saw this as an attempted kidnapping because you know, trauma and movies, which made him have to react in this way, kind of like he was springing into action. I am assuming that this is also after 1983 because I don't think that even a mall would hire a teenager as a security guard. And also at that point, Michael would have no reason to have this intense of a reaction if he didn't have trauma. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> but this could also explain why Michael is so quick to be fired in the games and it's because of his temper and odor and whatever, but mostly his temper. And finally in number one, Spring Trap. Okay, the, the movie being the first three games, I was seeing multiple tweets about it. It didn't really seem all that logical, but then the casting call for Cars in the early 90s kind of made it more believable for me. And then this. Okay, my, my, like, my thought process is like, why would you try to cram three games and nearly 40 years of content into a movie? Okay, we saw Spider-Man 3 and we know how that goes. But nevertheless, while Fazbear's Fright might have opened in 2023, which would make that timing perfect, I wasn't entirely convinced until an Instagram user in a now deleted post shared photos from their tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop, which in classic Funko fashion leaked multiple things about FNAF, including spring trap heads, indicating that they're definitely planning on having him appear. And considering how basically everything else confirms spring trap to be in the movie, he's probably gonna show up towards the end. Uh, I don't know, could be jumping around a bit. There was kind of like an alligator look and Monty thing there, um, but considering how Security Breach takes place after FNAF 6 and is the most recent game, uh, I doubt that it's actually going to appear in this one. But like I said, maybe in the third. Number 10, Stitch Wraith. This is a character who has appeared in the books exclusively. When Security Breach was slated for release, we all wondered if this would be the first game that the Stitch Wraith would appear in. If they would be given some kind of greater meaning beyond just being in the books. But alas, they did not appear. So sad. No Stitch Wraith for us. They weren't even hinted at in the game. But maybe this is the project where the Stitch Wraith will finally earn some kind of greater place in the lore. Maybe the film won't just focus on the games, but actually also deviate a little bit into the books as well. And we can see the Stitch Wraith introduced as an antagonist and perhaps even linked back to William and the Aftons in some way. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Gaming, and if you love when we talk FNAF, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button and don't miss out on any other FNAF content we got coming your way. After all, this movie will come out at some point, and we, then we're going to have so much to talk about. You're going to want to be here for that. Number 9. It was MatPat all along. This one is actually kind of adorable, but would also be terrifying for what it could mean for the lore by giving us a super meta twist of an ending during the finale of this film. Of course, it comes from the Game Theory subreddit, Game Theorists. Here, someone suggested an ending where the whole story is just revealed to be a theory, and in the end, MatPat is seen busting through the screen, proudly adding, a game theory! Honestly, this would be kind of brilliant, but making this make sense with the rest of the lore, that would be next to impossible and kind of terrifying. Even for MatPat, I'm sure. And therein lies the fear factor. Still, I think one of my favorite things about this theory is that a fan, Redditor Quickstack, added in the comments a FNAF 6 speech ending that was actually inspired by this theory. It starts, connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, MatPat, if you still even remember that name. But I'm afraid you've been misinformed. You are not here to lure, nor have you been called here by the individual you assume, although you have indeed been called. You have all been called here into a labyrinth of boxes and balloon boys, misdirection and misfortune, a labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. You don't even realize that you are going insane. Your lust for lore has driven you in endless circles, chasing the final timeline theory in some unseen detail, always seeming so near, yet somehow out of reach. But you will never find them. So great. Seriously, do yourself a favor and read the comment in its entirety over on the subreddit post. That's not the whole speech, but 
It's a little, it's a little taste. It's so good. I love that. Number eight, the bite of 87. What if the bite of 87 wasn't who he thought it was at all? What if it somehow wasn't even an animatronic? Is that possible? Or it was an animatronic who wasn't even supposed to be at the restaurant at that time. There's so little that we know when it comes to the bite of 87 that I'm willing to bet anything is possible when it comes to how twisty this could get. One theory that I had in relation to this potentially appearing in the movie is that it could be the lead in to connect us to a sequel. Now, maybe it was a nightmare animatronic or a fun time animatronic that was actually responsible, which will only be revealed in a post credits cut scene. And it will be this that will basically hint at what the next movie could be about and which game we'll kind of be exploring next. I could also see them going to something more recent and ending the movie with some kind of mega pizza plex tease with maybe even some kind of like, I don't know, janky early model of Monty being the one responsible here. Number seven, help wanted. While we expect Easter eggs to pretty much be everywhere in this film, including those pertaining to help wanted, I would even take this game's involvement in the film a step further. What if the twist is that this movie is actually the meta twist of help wanted? A movie that was helped to made turn a profit based on the sad real incidents of the real Freddy Fazbear's. What if at the end we learn this film is actually a film of what really happened? You know, we get like a director cut and then we're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And then it's basically just like kind of a dramatic reenactment that will be explored more via the real characters interacting with those that played them in the film in terms of the sequel. So like, we'll get the real story and then we'll have the dramatized story. Kind of like what we saw with American Horror Stories Roanoke season. I mean, that would be quite the twist. I definitely would not be expecting that. It might be a little too twisty, but could be a thing. Just cause you know, Help Wanted still is so, <laughs> mind boggling that that exists. Number six, Michael's true origin. What if Michael himself is revealed to be an animatronic? That would be quite the twist and is definitely something we've on and off theorized here on Top 10 Gaming. I mean, there are lots of questions left unanswered when it comes to Michael and his connection to William and his upbringing as a result of, you know, being William's son. I wonder if we'll find out that Michael wasn't actually the son of William, like in the traditional sense, but instead was a creation that William made for him and his partner to raise. And so it was kind of like his, I guess, animatronic son. Or perhaps Michael is a humanoid animatronic made to replace William and his partner's son who actually passed away. There are lots of ways this could make sense, but it would also be pretty shocking if the movie decided to go in this direction. However, I mean, it could. Anything's possible. Halfway through into number five, Ghost Kids. As I mentioned earlier, the Ghost Kids have been cast for the FNAF movie. Or at least uh, it appears as if the five Ghost Kids have been cast. But only two have been made official. Josephine Love is listed as Ghost Kid number five. And David Houston Doughty is listed as Ghost Kid number three. Which implies that there are still number one, two, and four. There are still a couple of unknowns at the moment as well. Uh, characters that don't have a name or actors that don't have a character name. Uh, Grant Feely still hasn't had a character name been officially added, and there are also a couple of characters with names that we're not familiar with. Garrett, Abby, and Max. These are all characters who don't really have in-game equivalents, and currently it's suspected that Garrett is Crying Child, Abby could be Elizabeth, and the newly cast Hank could be Henry Emily, meaning that Abby could instead be Charlie. But there's a lot that we are unclear about, but as it pertains to the Ghost Kids, number five seems to be Susie, and then Gabriel, Fritz, and Jeremy, and Gabriel, Fritz, and Jeremy, could be played by Grant Feely, Asher Colton Spence, and David Houston Doty. That leaves room for Cassidy. That could also be Abby or Cat Connor Sterling, whose character name is rumored to be Max. But considering the fact that it is rumored, I'm guessing that it could be that it's just a Cassidy that's older than we expected. And it for Vanessa. One of the interesting things about the casting is that someone has been cast as Vanessa. Yeah. Interestingly, there is a Vanessa character on the cast list, despite the Vanessa we know not being introduced until Security Breach where she seems to be in her early 20s. And considering how Security Breach takes place after FNAF 6, which takes place uh, uh, after 2023 at least, it can't be the same Vanessa from Security Breach unless this is a robot human situation like in the novels. But nevertheless, there is a Vanessa in this film who, ironically enough, is played by Elizabeth Lale. I don't know if that's intentional uh, because there is a theory that Vanessa or Vanny was an adult Elizabeth robot and 
that the ruined DLC girl is a younger Elizabeth robot, but damn. Okay, if that's not ironic, I don't know what is. Also, fun fact, I know Elizabeth Lale from playing Frozen's Anna in Once Upon a Time on ABC. Yeah. Anna to psychopathic serial killer bunny. What an arc. Number three, the detectives. I've always found the case involving William to be interesting because at the end of the day, they never were able or I guess were willing to keep him locked up. For some reason, they decided ultimately to set William loose on the world despite seeming to have some very compelling reasons to keep him held under custody during their investigation surrounding the incident that happened at Circus Baby's Pizza World. We see a glimpse into what appears to be their interrogation, or at the very least, their interview, let's say, of William in the opening titles for FNAF. Although, really, to me, it does seem more like an interrogation based on the line of questioning we have here. They definitely seem to suspect William as the creator of the animatronics used on site that incidentally malfunctioned. They seem to be kind of trying to link things back to him. Of course, his daughter was the one who was kind of harmed in that incident, so maybe that's why he was released, or maybe the police decided to cover up what really happened for their own reasons. Publicly calling the incident a gas leak, obviously, so that seems to imply that they didn't want people to know about what really happened for some reason, instead of, you know, calling it what it really was. Number two, the evidence. Well, it's pretty suspicious that William was held in custody and released during the incident at Circus Babies. What's even more strange, and a detail that I feel like we don't don't often spend too much time fixated on is even before this, William was captured by the authorities with evidence that he'd actually killed prior to this during the massacre at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Despite having supposedly caught William on camera in the act, they let him go because they couldn't find the bodies? However, this isn't typically how murder cases work. Just because you don't have the body doesn't mean you know you can't press charges. You have evidence proving that the missing parties were indeed killed. That should be enough. I'm hoping we can make sense of this, although I suspect they're kind of just going to straight up change this part of the story, because making it make sense feels pretty impossible to be honest if you're keeping a lot of these elements. Although hey, you know what, if they give us a fresh story that makes sense, at least they made sense of it, so I'm willing to take that. Number 1. Multiple Businesses The real question is, how was William even able to open up other restaurants after the fiasco of his first? Where was he getting this money from? Did he have investors? Is he an eccentric and sociopathic like rich person? I understand maybe after Fred Bear's Diner and the travesty that happened there, keeping Freddy Fazbear alive, but after being caught on camera as a murderer? How would he ever be able to open a similar business again? Even under a different name? Is this why he has a British accent and sister location? Is this a disguise? I don't understand how he ever could have opened Circus Baby's Pizza World. I just, I really don't. I'm just imagining William like doing a British accent to disguise himself for some reason. Being like, oh yes, I'm William Afton, but not, not that William Afton, no. I just, I look exactly like him, but I'm not that William Afton, no. Trust me, I would never murder anyone. Totally believable. In a 10, Henry Emily. Oh, come on, okay? Like, yeah, we want to see Henry in the movie, but it's also kind of required, in my opinion. He's like a main stake. And come on, William, did you really think that killing Charlotte wouldn't have any consequences? Like, you killed your business partner's daughter. That's going to be pretty obvious to him, especially when he was already suspecting something, okay? He took extra care to protect her, and then she still died. That's going to be a vengeful father if I have ever heard of one. Okay, and at that point, he like, he added protection onto her, and that was vengeful. And he didn't even need vengeance yet. So then, you know, he's after you because you killed his daughter. So why didn't you kill him next? All right? I don't know. G killing Henry could have done wonders for your criminal career. I mean, you're like, yeah, the cops were already suspicious of you, but as long as they can't find a body, you'll be clear again. And they won't put you away for the five missing kids. They won't put you away for a missing father as well. Okay, without a body, there's no forensic evidence. So yeah, just like finally off Henry and you'd be able to stay yourself or even like just this spring trap, which if you were spring lock when you killed him, it would be a whole other thing because it's not like they're going to put a robot spring lock suit on trial. And I just, I, I want him to be in the movie specifically so that it can be explained why he didn't kill Henry, basically. And in the nine, Springtrap. Speaking of Springtrap, I saw multiple tweets saying that the FNAF movie was going to be about the first three games in the series, which didn't really seem logical to me, because like, why would you try and cram 
three games of story and nearly 40 years of lore into one movie. We all know that too many villains usually does not go over well, Spider-Man 3. And while Fazbear's Fright might have actually opened in 2023, which makes the timing perfect for that, we weren't really sure if it was true. Until an Instagram user in a now deleted post shared photos of their tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop, which is the company making the animatronics for the movies. Which, the post included multiple spring trap hens, indicating that they're definitely planning on having him appear. And considering all the other information, it basically confirms Springtrap to be in the movie, which I think we were all expecting, but it's still nice to know. Probably towards the end if they're doing it linearly, but it, they could be jumping around a bit depending on how they want to present the plot, and if Oscar's involved with a time traveling ball pit. And it ain't Vanny! One of the interesting things about the casting is that someone has been cast as Vanessa. Weirdly enough, there is a Vanessa character on the cast list, despite Van the Vanessa that we know not being introduced until Security Breach, where she seems to be in her early 20s. That's what I was talking about in the intro when I said characters being cast that couldn't even be born yet. And considering how Security Breach takes place after FNAF 6, which most likely takes place post-2023, yeah, it, it couldn't really be the same Vanessa from Security Breach unless this is a robot human situation like in the novels. But nevertheless, there is a Vanessa in this film who ironically enough is played by Elizabeth Lale. I don't know if that's intentional, um, because, you know, there's the theory that Vanessa or Vanny is an adult Elizabeth robot and that the ruined DLC girl is a younger Elizabeth robot. Um, but if that theory is true, then we could technically be seeing Vanny in the FNAF movie, even if she hasn't become Vanny yet. Vanessa also being a robot Elizabeth adult would kind of explain how Glitch Trap infected her, rather than just driving her nuts like it did to Jeremy before. And it's Seven Dr. Lillian. Speaking of crying, child, he's most definitely going to get bit in this movie. Like, come on, I mean that moment, the bite of 83 is the catalyst for a whole load of the series. Without the chomping, Mike would wouldn't have had a reason to go against his father and we never would have gotten the games. And since this movie is taking place in the 80s, I'm guessing that Crying Child is going to die either early on or in flashbacks. Or dare I say, fnaf -shbacks. Eh? Sorry, I've been gone for a while. So when Tazaday Young was listed as Dr. Lillian on the movie's IMDb, it's actually very possibly the doctor that looks after Crying Child after he gets chopped. Originally, I thought Dr. Lillian would be the therapist that Mike was seeing, but after the social worker reveal, I think it definitely makes more sense that the Lillian is the medical doctor. Also, fun fact, Tadase Young was in an episode of the Winchesters, meaning that the FNAF movie is in the supernatural multiverse, and by extension, the Arrowverse, thanks to that one Legends of Tomorrow episode. You're welcome. In at six, Bailey Winston. Now, there is very little information about this one, but according to their actor's access resume, Bailey Winston has been cast in the FNAF movie as Kim. We don't know who the character is, uh, we don't know if this is a fake name or if the character is like the equivalent to a character from the games, but it could be that the character was created for the purposes of the movie, since there are more characters needed for a movie than in a game where the story is contained to only the aspects that we need to see, and b everyone else aside from us basically are animatronics. So these could be entirely new characters that are being introduced in into this series that could have no equivalent in the games, or it could be that they are meant to be characters from the games, but with new names to show us that these aren't the same worlds, as a way to keep the mystery of the games alive and not solved by the movie so that they can continue to release the games and do well. <sighs> Corporate America. Halfway through in number five, Gregory. The main reason I want Gregory in this movie is because the knowledge that this kid has exceeds even some of my own. The kid is the size of a four year old, can fit inside of Glam Rock Freddy's cake cavity. He can fit inside baby strollers and other various small areas around the pizza plex. He's too small to drive one of the go-karts alone, but he knows how to restart generators, operate a trash compactor, start and drive a van, as well as identify a car battery, connect the jumper cables to that car battery properly, and then use those to fix Freddy's whole recharging every hour issue in one of the endings. So how the living hell does that character as a whole make any sense? And how do Freddy and 
Gregory make it to the hill without needing to recharge in that ending? Like, how do they solve that issue? Oh, I don't know, man. This kid knows more words than I do, but somehow is the size of a three and a half year old, maybe four. No, okay? It makes absolutely no sense, and this kid's weird superpower is the reason Security Breach is so confusing. It would really only make sense if he is a robot that's supposed to mimic a toddler, but who's actually been on for decades and has been learning the entire time. So, if that is the case and he's been on for that long, it would be possible for him to appear in the movie. So he f***ing better. It only makes sense. In it for Scooby-Doo. <laughs> This is purely because I think William Afton making a Scooby-Doo reference would be hilarious. Obviously, I don't think that it's going to happen because it, it would probably ruin the tone of the movie, but I don't know. Movies or shows referencing an actor's previous work is not an unheard thing. There's entire compilations of series referencing previous movies and shows that their actors starred in or guested in or whatever it be. With shows from the Arrowverse talking about Victor Garber and the Titanic or Brandon Ruth returning as Superman, but also Supernatural had a whole episode where Jared and Jensen played Sam and Dean in a world where Supernatural was a TV show. So they played their characters playing themselves. So yeah, productions making references to our world's dynamic in their scripts is nothing new. It's like when Bones had Emily and Zoe Deschanel on as like cousins in the show, but then one of the characters is like, oh, you two could be sisters. Okay, <laughs> come on. Okay, and while those may seem like extreme examples, this is a series where a serial killer dies, possesses a hard drive, gets scanned into a VR game, and then is able to possess another person's brain and control them into bringing his body, which is stuck in a robot suit, back from death. So yeah, it's 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 really not that far out of the question to have Afton say zoinks, or to have a dog that's called Scooby like walk up to him and like interact, and then have Afton flip out on the dog to show that he's psycho, okay? Something like that, just come on, that'd be funny, you have to admit. Getting close to the end of number three, Kelsey. The story, The New Kid from 1.35 AM, the third Fast Bear Frights book, revolves around Devin, Mick, and Kelsey. Devin and Mick are outcasts from their class and aren't really all that popular. They aren't cool, they aren't me. <laughs> Totally kidding, they're definitely me. But when the new kid Kelsey arrives at the school, they make a new friend, or try to. Despite Kelsey being charismatic and adored by everyone, he still decides to hang with these two, which doesn't seem accurate. Over time though, Devin grows jealous of Kelsey, since Kelsey is everything that he wants. So in an act of revenge, or to gain control like some serial killer origin story, Devin hatches a plan to lure Kelsey to an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's and trap him in a springlock suit for a few hours. To like try to humble him, I guess? I don't know. I don't know why they think that you can trap someone in a springlock suit without killing them. But of course, the plan goes horribly wrong. Wrong. After getting in the springlock suit, it fails, as expected, causing blood to soak into the fur of the animatronic and pool all around the ground because, you know, it's a book and they don't have to worry about game ratings. So Devin and Mick leave Kelsey for dead so they won't get in trouble, but then something doesn't feel right, so for some reason Devin returns to make sure that Kelsey's body is still in there, which is a horrible idea. So he sticks his hand in the animatronic mouth to make sure, I don't know why, and then snap. The spring locks fail again in his hand, not in the mouth, because that's not where the spring locks are, and then Devin gets his hand stuck inside and bleeds out. But not before seeing a body in the suit with black hair instead of Kelsey's blonde. So I want this explained in the movie. I do. Cast a god Kelsey, for God's sakes. There's no other, the, these characters don't have names that have appeared anywhere, so just cast a frickin' Kelsey, please, for the love of God. But ultimately, in number two, Katniss Everdeen. I also think it would be hilarious for Katniss Everdeen to appear in this movie. Not like as a way to connect the universes, but exclusively because of who is playing Mike. I mean, come on, okay? This guy's IMDB has him listed as being known for Hunger Games movies almost exclusively. Josh Hutcherson would not be where he is if it wasn't for those, and much like the Scooby-Doo or Shaggy reference, I think it would be funny to have like a Katniss thing in here, okay? Even if it's just a joke. Or make Mike really good with a bow and arrow, since like he took up the sport to try to relieve anger because his therapist suggested it or something, and then they're just like, oh, you're a natural Katniss Everdeen, or like, oh, you'd win the Hunger Games. I don't know. That I think 
think that that would be the funniest shit, all right? Come on, you gotta have a little comedy in something like this. And Scott seems like the kind of guy who would be down for that. He does all sorts of random, unexplained crap in his games. So like, a, a couple of passing references to past work that the actors have done, it wouldn't be out of nowhere. I personally would appreciate a Once Upon a Time Anna reference from the girl playing v uh, Vanessa, Elizabeth Lale. Please. And finally, in a number one conspiracy podcast. While Markiplier seems to be implying that he will be making an appearance in the movie, there are some other YouTubers that, like I said earlier, flat out just said that they were invited to check out the set and watch filming. The four that we know of, of course, being Docco, as well as Ape at Ryan, Rizbowski, and Basim Alum, aka the Theory Thursday crew. From the looks of things, they're just going to vlog on the set and film content for the respective channels. However, there could be something more here, like maybe a cameo or a, or a consultation kind of thing that they wouldn't have revealed for obvious reasons. Although consultation would be a far less of like a major thing, but considering how Scott is on set, they wouldn't really need it, but it could also just be like from like a fan's perspective kind of thing so that we can understand the story of the movie and have it not get confused since we don't know everything about the games. I don't know. It, they could be doing something like that, but they could also be doing exactly what they did on Thursdays as characters in the movie. So could Theory Thursday actually be a podcast within the FNAF universe? In a 10 crying child's name. FNAF 4 is one of the most frustrating games in the series and like Come on, I, I mean, ever since it first released, we've been fighting over the events of this game and everything else about it. We've even been fighting about if the game actually happened or if it was all a dream. And while we assume that Lucas Grant's character, this Garrett, is meant to be crying child, it could very well not be. However, if it is, it not only solves a name that we've been curious about since 2015, but it also explains Gregory's name in a way, since Gregory and Garrett are fairly similar names. So it would make sense for a robot version of a kid named Garrett to switch his name to Gregory when going rogue. But of course, there's no way to be sure of that name currently. Okay, but it's entirely possible that the FNAF moving casting has already given us Crying Child's name. And no, it's not Norman because of FNAF VR's table model, alright? That was just the default name of the model. Plus, I, I didn't, like, it didn't even get used in the game. In at 9, Chica's Party World. Chica's Party World is a possible location that was mentioned in the source code of many teasers for Sister Location. It had actual, like, no presence within the game and wasn't confirmed to mean anything, but it's still a question we've been having. Chica's Party World also has a very similar name to the Chica's Party minigame from FNAF 3, but it's in essence just an excuse for why Chica wasn't in FNAF Sister location. Some people have theorized that Circus Baby's old pizzeria is Chica's Party World, even though there's no evidence to back it up. And it's also theorized that it's possible the characters that would have been in Chica's Party World would have been JJ, Funtime Chica, Lolbit, and Yendo, because they all have a similar style. The spring lock suit used on Night 4 in Sister Location has also been theorized to be from Chica's Party World, maybe belonging to Funtime Chica, but there's no evidence to support that other than the mask of the suit being kind of similar to Toy Chica's head from FNAF 2. But the ice cream shop that's been seen in BTS photos of the FNAF movie features Chica's rainbow from FNAF World as its mascot, which makes me think that this could be Chica's party world where they have the whole fight in the fountain, and it could be like a prototype pizzaplex in a way. And it ain't real FNAF. While we might have almost had a real Freddy Fazbear's pizza with that delivery service that Virtual Dining Concepts was working on with Scott Cawthon that was seemingly cancelled or postponed for the time being, possibly due to the movie. However, to make up for all that being cancelled, we got set photos of the Freddy's location from the FNAF movie, or at least one of the Freddy's locations that would be in the movie since there could be more than one, but the one that we've had shots of right now is abandoned in the context of the movie, because the sign is on the ground and has been kind of removed, it's basically like a skeleton now. We originally got pictures of the facade of the building being built, and then we got to see the actual sign and finally the finished set, but apparently people online were actually also upset with the sign, which I kind of understand, but also don't think is fair. Like, yeah, FNAF is a huge series and they could have a more elaborate design, but this is also just what the Chuck E. Cheese sign looks like, but with a FNAF character. So obviously, like, that's what they're going to lean towards. Okay, come on, guys. It's like every fake Freddy's that someone has made for a YouTube thumbnail ever, because it's basically just Chuck E. Cheese. It's also since been taken down since they finished filming with the location, but it's still pretty cool to see. And we finally know what actually, like, the FNAF building would look like.
And it's 7 FNAF 3. The whole the movie is the first three games thing actually didn't really make sense to me until I figured out that like the actual dates of the cars is showing us what the date for the movie is, okay? It's confusing, but let me explain. While there has been no official announcement, we know that the biggest moments in establishing the plot of the games take place in the 80s, with Crying Child, Elizabeth, and Charlotte all biting it in 1983, and in Crying Child's case, quite literally biting it. And then, the Missing Children's Incident takes place in 1985, and we can't forget the infamous bite of 87. FNAF 1 takes place in 1993, FNAF 2 in 87, and FNAF 3 would take place this year, 2023, since the description says 30 years after Freddy's closes, which would have had to be the FNAF 1 location in 93. So, they already have like 2023 cars on the set because I mean, it, it's 2023. However, there was a casting call on Central Casting that was asking for cars from the late 70s to early 90s, which makes sense for the time frame of the first two games as well as the third, and also establishes those games as taking place within those years. Because I mean, like, come on, it would be kind of weird to have Crying Child being rushed to the hospital in the 2019 Toyota Corolla plus you know the 93 they have cars in the early 90s so yeah there you go and at 6, Markiplier. Yep, you heard me right. In a recent interview with Variety, Markiplier was asked about the FNAF movie, and he implied quite heavily that he'd be making an appearance, saying, quote, Everyone wants to know. There was a lot of confusion. Yeah, I can't say anything particular about that. There was a lot of scheduling conflict, and I can't say anything. Which is his way of saying that he's making at least a cameo, because why else would there be scheduling conflicts if he didn't need to have free time to actually go to the movie? movie set uh, if he wasn't in the movie because come on he it wouldn't have had any scheduling conflicts because he wouldn't have to worry about scheduling it with other things you know what I'm saying but also if you're not in something you don't say I can't say anything okay we all knew that Andrew Garfield was appearing in No Way Home and he was saying that he wasn't he wasn't saying I can't say anything because that's just saying I'm not I can't say anything is saying something so yeah maybe that detail will confirm Markiplier's place within the game lore since on November 25th 2019 at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time a Lumix official released the official launch trailer for FNAF AR Special Delivery on YouTube. And in the two minute long trailer, we see Markiplier being the one advertising the Fazbear Funtime service, which is the service that the game is based off of, because you're ordering animatronics through that service. But yeah, he's already in the game lore, so maybe this will just establish him properly. Number 5, Nightmare Animatronics. One of the most wild things that I think definitely could use some exploration, but isn't really, I would say, a major point that we focus on, usually, is the Nightmare Animatronics. Where did they come from? Are they real? Are they hallucinations or literal nightmares? I'm hoping that the movie may introduce us to the nightmare animatronics in a way that explains exactly what they are and I guess why they exist. Personally for me, this is something that is really only touched on or at least appears to be only touched upon in the games and a little bit in the books. We even see one drawn on the back of the FNAF survival handbook, which may imply that these animatronics do exist in real life otherwise how would you draw that but I don't know if they do exist in real life because if they do like why do they exist what's their purpose maybe that's a nightmare animatronic that was drawn from a dream or are they just some freakish creations that William made just for fun to scare kids I mean likely his own kids because I feel like those are the ones that were the most bothered by them. That seems weird to me, so here's hoping we get some answers about like what is even happening with Nightmare Animatronics. Are they even real? I don't know. Number 4, Discovery of Remnant. Something else that I'm super curious about, but that does not really seem to be a focus of the in-game narrative at all, is the discovery of Remnants. More specifically, how William found out about Remnant. In the games and in the books, we know that Remnant or strong emotions like Agony is how the animatronics are able Able to remain alive. But we don't really know how or why Remnant was discovered in the games. Remnants are also kind of basically like souls, but we call them Remnant, we don't call them souls, so I don't know what's up with that. In the books, we know that Dr. Talbert is studying Remnant, while Phineas Taggart, his colleague, seems to be studying the other
another powerful concept of agony and its properties and effects. Talbert was apparently researching Remnant in the hopes of holding on to memories of his daughter who at one point was very sick. Talbert was worried she basically would not survive her illness, although she ultimately did survive. In the games, we know even less about Remnant, which also seems to be somewhat different from the description that we're given of it in the books, so it'd be kind of nice to clarify some of this in the movie and also, I guess, define a little bit more what Remnant is and how William found out about it. Getting close to the end into number three sequels. Thanks to an interview with Matthew Lillard, who plays William Afton in the movie, we know that he signed a three picture deal with Blumhouse in regards to the Five Nights at Freddy's movies. So it's very possible that we get upwards of two sequels at least, which also makes sense if you look at it in other ways too. From a film production and marketing standpoint, trilogies have been a staple of various franchises for decades. The Star Wars movies came out in trilogies, Divergent, the Marvel heroes all get their own trilogies, not including team ups, Christopher Nolan's Batman, Sam Raimi's Spider Man, the list goes on. So, a trilogy of FNAF movies wouldn't be out of the ordinary, especially if the first one does well. I mean, if Sonic can get a sequel, I'm sure that FNAF will. And there's also the point that from what I've been seeing, it's possible that this movie is going to be including the first three games in the series, which would make sense if we're trying to base the trilogy off the nine full games that have been released thus far. And considering how there's been a leak of someone who took a tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop and saw Springtrap heads, I think that this has more weight to it. And the FNAF novels, which I'm sure also had an influence over the story of the films, are also a trilogy. So honestly, I think that this will do well enough that they're definitely going to get a trilogy out of it. And you know what? Jason Blum may even find the film so fun that he'd let another two happen even if they didn't do great, but feel like they're gonna make a profit. But ultimately, in number two, movie date. The whole the movie is about the first three games thing also makes sense when looking at the date the film is set in. While there have been no official announcements, I mean, we know that the big moments establishing the plot of the games take place in the 80s. Crying Child, Elizabeth, and Charlotte all biting it in 1983. In Crying Child's case, though, quite literally. And then the Missing Children's Incident takes place in 1985, and we can't forget that infamous bite of 87. FNAF 1 takes place in 1993, FNAF 2 in 87, and FNAF 3 would take place this year, 2023, since the description says 30 years after Freddy's closes, which would have to be the FNAF 1 location in 1993. So they already have 2023 cars, okay? However, there was a casting call of sorts on Central Casting that asked for cars from the late 70s to 90s, which makes sense for the time frame of the first two games, as well as the other important establishing moments. Because I don't know about you, but having Crying Child being rushed to the hospital in a 2019 Toyota Corolla kind of be weird in my eyes. Ah, if only they had asked for a 67 Impala. Uh, that's a reference that no one's gonna get on this channel. And finally, in number one, Missing Children's Incident. The Missing Children's Incident is the inciting moment for the whole series. Without the Missing Children's Incident, we never have gotten the first game, which means that we're expecting to see something similar in the movie, albeit a little more tame, I'm sure, since it's probably going to be rated PG-13. But we know that there's going to be a 1980s crime scene thanks to a casting call found on Central Casting, searching for both adults and children for this scene. And I mean, out of everything we know in the series, it's most likely an MCI scene rather than a bite of 87 or crying child death scene, since I don't really think that those would be classified as crimes or crime scenes. I don't know. And thanks to the Fazbear Frights books, we know that the missing children's incident takes place in 1985. So yeah, that's probably what this is going to be. And I hope that Oscar pops out of a ball pit real quick. Number 10, first meeting. There are so many questions I have when it comes to the Aftons. Aside from the actual possibility of meeting Mrs. Afton, which is pretty exciting if we get that, I would love to learn more about the intricacies of the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Afton. Should we, you know, of course, get to meet her. Chiefly, I'd like to know how she and William first met and what that meeting was like. I mean, how does one end up in a relationship with a serial killer? It's a fascinating and I think important detail that many of us overlook in favor of searching for the answer to the question, does she even exist and you know, what happened to her if she did? To help make all of whatever that story will be makes sense though, I'd like to know more about how her and William started off as opposed to just how they got to where they are now. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Gaming, and if you love our FNAF content, be sure to check out our FNAF playlist for even more FNAF content. We got a lot of it. Number 9, M.O. Okay, so why is William's modus operandi stuffing his victims in suits? I just want to understand that logic. It's not a big thing in regards to the whole, you know, why does he even kill people question, but 
Why dispose of the bodies in a way that basically you'd think would allow you to be very easily caught? And how was he never really caught? I mean, I guess he kind of was caught, but then he wasn't like permanently caught. I have a lot of questions in regards to this smaller detail. I know the motive for the killings should be our focus in terms of what we want this movie to explain to us, and honestly, that's also a huge question for me, but this is also a smaller detail that I need an answer to. Help me out, FNAF movie! Number 8 Name of Crying Child Is this a tiny detail? It seems tiny on paper. After all, we already kind of have a name for CC, I mean, it's Crying Child, so we have something to, you know, denote them by and call them by, but it is strange that we don't have any kind of legal name for them. For me, this name has always been part of a greater mystery, but it could just be a simple name, like Evan, the name many of us consider to be most likely the real name for Crying Child at this point. I really wanted Gregory to be Crying Child, although this seemed like it would be an odd fit, but I'm still hoping that we get some sense made of both of these characters and their interesting similarities to one another. Getting Crying Child's name potentially in the FNAF movie could be a step in that direction. Number 7 Michael's Childhood I'm not even talking here about what Michael's true parentage or origin is. This is more about the smaller details in regards to his childhood. Did he have friends? What were they like? Where did he go to school? What were his aspirations in regards to, you know, what he wanted to be when he grew up? Did he always want to be a security guard? I'm more hoping we get a sense for what his childhood was like and what his feelings are towards that. I mean, I'm also hoping that this is something we get in addition to answering the bigger question of, you know, Michael's parentage and how that all works and exactly what he knows of his connection to the Afton name. But for the most part, I just really want to know more about Michael as a character, as he feels, you know, kind of one note at this point. I just want him to be more developed. And a good way to get to know him better would likely be through his own connections to his past and his feelings about that. Number 6 Legal Matters Something that is very strange in regards to this franchise is that at no point does there appear to be any indication that Fazbear Entertainment had any kind of legal matters. The closest I feel like we get is with FNAF VR when we have to sign, you know, kind of like a legal contract or a waiver before starting the game that seems to be summarizing everything that could go wrong and how you basically accept that Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for anything that does go wrong. I'm not sure how Fazbear Entertainment managed to dodge responsibility this entire time, but I'm hoping we're going to see more waivers like this in the movie to kind of explain that. I mean, you've, you've got to, right? Or we've got to see like there were actually legal matters that just haven't been described at all in the games or the books. I'm just saying. Number 5 Michael Doesn't Know What is interesting is that while in the games we've always assumed that Michael was aware of his parentage, it's possible that this was actually a mystery to him until later on. Although it's weird we've never really seen this revelation explored if it did happen in the game continuity. It's not super surprising considering, you know, how much of the story feels like it's mostly left out of the games and basically is only hinted at by small clues and easter eggs and mostly just exists in our mind, leaving us with some kind of weird trail of breadcrumbs that we need to like make sense of. What if this movie opens with Mike not knowing the truth of his own origins and whose son he really is? William knows and offers Mike a job and it is through his time working at Freddy's that he basically discovers who his father really is. After all, the name that we are given for Mike in the film is Schmidt, not Afton, which either implies that Mike is going undercover or is distancing himself from the family name because of controversy or that he simply just does not know what his name really is. And he thinks his name is Schmidt. I don't know. Number 4 The Afton Family House What if in the end Michael returns to his family home and learns the truth of his father's madness, and the extent of it by finding either the nightmare animatronics or maybe sister location? I know there are those of us who would like to see allusions to other games, and this could be a good way to do that by kind of misdirecting us and making us feel that, you know, Michael is safe at the end of this movie, has defeated William, and even, you know, returns to his old home now that he knows his connection to William. However, it is here that he actually discovers the nightmare is not yet over because he uncover something. Ooh, spooky! Number 3 Henry Emily's Role I think an interesting and unexpected twist for fans could be found in the introduction of Henry Emily. Now we know Henry was William's partner and he is generally portrayed in the franchise as being, you know, the more heroic figure in contrast to the villain and antagonist that is William Afton. However, what if this movie flips the script on those roles and instead we discover that Henry is actually the evil one in the end who perhaps manipulated William and used him as a scapegoat. 
I don't know about you, but I would kind of be down for an alternative redemption arc for William. And perhaps everything was done simply to make William look bad because I don't know, maybe Henry was holding a grudge against him in relation to their business dealings, or perhaps an accident involving his daughter, which he blames William for. I don't know. I just think this could be a good way to make sense of you know some of this tangled web of lore we found ourselves in, where a lot of the stuff with William doesn't quite add up and make sense entirely. Well, things being cryptic in the games really does work because it allows us to kind of like fill in the gaps and solve a puzzle. In the film, we're probably going to need more of a solid and clear path for the story and motivations of its characters. So this could help give us that. Number two, Mike is the killer. What if everything we know gets turned on its head and it is Michael, not William, that ends up the killer? After all, this is a completely new continuity. so. Anything is possible. I would actually kind of welcome a twist like this as long as we were given some kind of, you know, plausible motivation for why or how it went this way. There's one little thing this film has to do for me, and that is simply to give me a motivation for why all the bloodshed happened in the first place. That's all I want. If it can do that, no matter what else I'm given, I will leave the theater happy. I promise. <laughs> Number one, no twist. This would be a sad reality if this was the twist we got, that there simply, you know, wasn't one at all. I mean, I feel like I would be very surprised if this happened, and it would also likely mean I think that the movie wasn't good overall, which is kind of scary. I don't want to live in that reality. I mean, I don't see how you can do Freddy's without having some kind of twist or mystery that leaves us all kind of like in shock and thinking about things after the film is over. This has become so much a part of my expectation that it would be more shocking to not have a twist. In a 10 game theorist cop. Now, in another video, I said that YouTubers were invited to take a look at the set, but MatPat wasn't one of them. And Game Theory is such a huge influence on the game's success that it really deserves its own mention. Something more than like a possible FNAF video game cameo montage a la Free Guy. But I think that the show of Game Theory specifically should have its own like reference or character, as maybe even like a crime podcast or online conspiracy website trying to sort out the mysteries of Pretty fast bears pizza. I don't know. I think that might be one of the better ways that they can incorporate it. Or maybe there's just an investigating detective that's named Matthew or is played by Matt Bat. I don't know. I just think that like a, a little extra nod to the guy that really made the majority of us aware of the series is definitely deserved, if not required, especially by the fans. I wouldn't have known about FNAF if it wasn't for Matt Pat choosing it over Slenderman because of a poll. So. Yeah, but he also said that he didn't have an idea for what that Slenderman theory could have been. So maybe he would have just went with FNAF anyway, but I think we can all agree that MatPat deserves at least a reference in the movie. In at 9, Ballora. Some believe that Ballora was intended to be a form of mother figure for the Afton kids once their mother left, or died, or was killed, or whatever happened to her. Maybe she never even existed. This is based off the idea that the mini Renas and Ballora are basically kind of like a family, and that Ballora is a mother to the mini Renas, and the fact that there would be one for each Afton kid and then another one that's spare. This could just be William having mommy issues um, or it could be that there is a secret fourth Afton kid like I've proposed in the past although I highly doubt it. And if that is the case maybe Vanessa is supposed to be that kid hence why she'd be a robot. Or Vanessa just is like the human version of Ballora so the kids wouldn't freak out because baby can change between human and not human in the books and uh, yeah. Um, but then again it could just be Afton wanting to be treated like a kid and have someone to hold him and make the pain go away. I mean it's definitely not the healthiest option but it's something Sigmund Freud would be proud of. So yeah if she is supposed to be a mother to the kids if she's not in the movie it's gonna be kind of confusing. And it ain't Markiplier. In a recent interview with Variety Markiplier was asked about the FNAF movie, and he implied quite heavily that he will be making an appearance, saying, quote, Everyone wants to know. There was a lot of confusion. Yeah, I can't say anything particular about that. There's a lot of scheduling conflict, and I can't say anything. Which is his way of saying that he's at least making an appearance, because why else would there be scheduling conflicts if he didn't need to have the free time to be in the movie? But within the FNAF community, this man is also a behemoth, having played through every game, most 
popular fan games and then more. People call him the FNAF King. You can't think of FNAF without thinking of this man as well as MatPad, okay? But mostly, that didn't really mean much and he was just a fan of the series until November 25th, 2019 at 9 a.m. EST when a Lumix official released the official launch trailer for FNAF AR Special Delivery on YouTube. In that two minute long trailer, we see Markiplier being the one advertising the Fazbear Funtime service, which the game is based off. So, yeah, he's already, like, I don't know what's going on, it's unknown, like, what character he's playing, uh, but in all honesty, Markiplier was already canon in the games, or I guess technically in the game lore, so he might as well be in the movie. Right? And if you guys are looking forward to the FNAF movie and want to know more about it, be sure you hit subscribe because when we know, you'll know. Or maybe slightly after because I stopped the script. And it's Seven Crying Child. Okay, now this one is certainly going to be controversial, but Crying Child hasn't officially been cast. And I say this every time I bring it up, uh, his death wasn't a Springlock failure, all right? I, I watched the Matt Pat timeline recently. He says it was a Springlock failure, but it couldn't have been. The reason I know it wasn't a Springlock failure is because the Fred Bear suit was already in animatronic mode. So no Springlocks would have had the chance of failing. Because the term Springlock failure refers to when the Springlock mechanisms that move robot parts away fail to keep those parts in place, snapping them back into animatronic mode, and then that's when you get filled with all the, the metal bits, which is bad if someone's inside. But if you're in a robot mode, there's no spring locks that can fail because they're not being moved. Plus, there's no mechanisms inside the mouth because no parts of the human would be in the mouth. So yeah, the jaw just moves up and down. <laughs> It would have had to be superpowered in order to crush the skull, something that only William would have been able to integrate, considering how, you know, he made the robots and is the suit technician and stuff. So, yeah, I'm hoping Crying Child's in the movie. And while we assume that this Garrett character is meant to be Crying Child, it could very well not be, so I had to say it. Alright, I did. And at six, Charlotte Emily. Charlotte is one of the most troublesome victims that Afton has ever had. Being his first direct victim and seemingly second indirect victim, Charlotte gets killed outside of one of the original pizzerias, despite desperate attempts from her father Henry to prevent that, mainly by creating a security animatronic designed like a puppet to protect other kids but then treat her as a priority, which is kind of selfish, especially if you know that your partner is going to be a serial killer, but you know, that's aside the point. However, when it gets trapped in a box and it's unable to actually make it out to Charlotte in time to save her, she ends up getting shanked. So, in another attempt, the puppet tries to save her in a different way, allowing her agony to reach out and take hold of the animatronic and thus becoming one in a sense. As the puppet, Charlotte then went on to share her gift of life with the other animatronics, or I guess with the other victims of the original five, resulting in uh, ultimately William's undoing. But yeah, in a way, Charlotte is really the one he shouldn't have killed, but that's, that's a whole other character and basically, she needs to be in the movie, uh, and she hasn't been cast, or at least hasn't been named directly. So, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe, maybe that's who Abby's supposed to be. Halfway through into number five, Afton Family. It also appears as if the entire Afton Family has been cast in the movie, or at least, um, is planned on being cast. Matthew Lillard as William, Josh Hutchinson as Mike, Lucas Grant as Crying Child, whose character is currently named Garrett, Mary Stuart Masterson as a female villain who could be the mother, but Elizabeth is where it gets kind of complicated. While with the mother and Crying Child, we can be a little loose with their names since we never really knew them, we know Elizabeth's name. So while some people think that Piper Rubio as Abby could be Elizabeth, that doesn't seem all too likely. I mean, like, we have names of half the Aftons as their in-game versions, so why would we change the daughter that a whole load of people are fans of? That, that seems like it would cause some issues. It could also be possible that the younger Vanessa that is meant to be cast is going to be Elizabeth, uh, which would mean that the entire family hasn't been cast yet, but it's possible. Abby could also be meant to be the movie version of Charlie, Henry's daughter. So, since these characters are using names that we haven't seen before, it's difficult to know who could be involved, which I think is 
basically the point, since if pictures leak of, let's say, the characters Carl and Garrett doing scenes, we don't know if that's because Garrett isn't meant to be crying child, or if Carl is someone else entirely. So it's a good way to protect the story while also giving fans something to chew on and talk about to death, like us. And it for YouTubers. While Markiplier seems to be implying that he'll be making an appearance in the FNAF movie, there are some other YouTubers who flat out said that they were invited to the set to check out the filming. The four that we know of, of course, being Docco, as well as 8-Bit Ryan, Razbowski, and Basimalum, aka the Theory Thursday crew. From the looks of things, they're just going to vlog on the set and film content for their respective channels. However, there could be something more here like cameos or consultation that they haven't revealed for obvious reasons. Although consultation would be like far less of a major thing uh, and considering how Scott is on set we don't really need someone else there to consult them but it could be like a consulting them from like a fans perspective kind of thing and how we as outsiders see the series without knowing the full story like Scott does so who knows? Getting close to the end and in number three, Freddy Fazbear First Look. We did actually get a set photo of what is presumably the Freddy animatronic made by Jim Henson's Creature Shop around the time of the last part as well. There was only the one photo and it was very far away so the quality was abysmal, but if I'm honest, it actually gave me hope for the movie and more than I had originally. I thought the animatronics for the movie would be CGI or closer to like the Iron Man suits in the MCU where only part of the character is practical and then they fill in the rest with CGI, or that it would be an animatronic suit, but with a dude wearing a green morph suit on the inside being the end of skeleton. But seeing the animatronic without green and actually looking like what I pictured a real Freddy to look like is absolutely insane and incredibly encouraging. Blumhouse was put on the map with Paranormal Activity, and that was with a minimal budget, but with everything they can do now, they're not holding back with this movie, and it brings me joy, okay? I'm really hoping that this movie is good. And ultimately, in at number two, Michael Whalen. Michael Whalen is now listed on the IMDb page for the FNAF movie as the composer and conductor. Whalen is a two-time Emmy award-winning composer known for films like Dallas Buyers Club, What's Eating Dad, Veronica Decides to Die, and interestingly, the Pokemon Puzzle League video game from 2000, and the Oprah Winfrey Show for one episode. Episode. So, yeah, if they got an Emmy Award winning composer on this project, you know that the sound design and atmosphere is going to be excellent. I am preparing for this movie to be terrifying, uh, despite hating horror myself, but mostly I hate horror because jump scares are just too much sensory overload at once, and it messes with my brain to such a degree that it actually, like, makes me angry. Uh, yeah, like, come on, guys. Being scared is not a good thing, people. But also, I say that, and that, like, I say that I hate being scared, yet I, I was hit by a car a few days ago and only went to the hospital because I thought that the bike I was on was broken. That's, that's, that, that's why I'm... No, I have the band-aid on. Yeah, if I didn't think it was broken, I would have just kept going to my destination, but I didn't think I had a way back to my hotel. So yeah, that's the only reason I stopped. <laughs> I wasn't scared at all for that, which is super weird. Um, and then I also was thinking while I was flying that if the plane crashed, at least I would be able to put my 100 hours playing the forest to use. So, so yeah, fear is, is weird with me. Are we sure I only have six mental disorders? And finally, in a number one, spring trap. I saw multiple tweets saying that the FNAF movie was going to be about the first three games in the series, which didn't seem all that logical to me, because like, why would they try and cram three games and nearly 40 years of content into one movie? We all know that that usually doesn't go over well. And while Fazbear's Fright may have opened in 2023, which makes the timing perfect, we weren't really sure that it was true. Until an Instagram user in a now deleted post shared photos from their tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop, which included multiple spring traps heads, indicating that they're definitely planning on having him appear. And considering everything else, it basically confirms Springtrap to be in the movie. Probably towards the end if they're doing it linearly, but it could be uh, jumping around a bit depending on the plot. It's also worth noting that there's another head in the background of the last image of the collage that seems to be extremely similar to Monty after being broken in Security Breach. But considering how Security Breach takes place years after FNAF 6, meaning decades after FNAF 3, it's unlikely that he 
he'll appear in this movie, but probably in the third that they have planned, considering how Matthew Lillard did sign contracts for three films. So they could already be working on their other props, uh, but these could also just simply be remains from another project. And it's in Freddy Fazbear's. While we might have already had a real Freddy Fazbear's pizza with the delivery service that Virtual Dining Concepts was working on with Scott Cawthon, that was seemingly cancelled or postponed for the time being at least, possibly due to the movie. However, to make up for it, we did get set photos of the Freddy's location for the FNAF movie, or at least one of the Freddy's locations, since there could be more than one. But the one that we've had shots of right now is abandoned in the context of the movie. We originally got pictures of the facade being built, and then we got to see the actual sign and finally the finished set. Apparently people online were upset with the sign, uh, which I can kind of understand, but also don't find fair. Like yes, FNAF is a huge series that could have had a more elaborate sign, this is basically what the Chuck E. Cheese signs look like, so obviously that's going to be what they lean towards. Come on guys, okay? It's every fake Freddy's that anyone's ever made for a thumbnail, because it's basically just Chuck E. Cheese. It's also since been taken down since they finished filming with that location. In the 9, Bad Cupcake. The current working title, or as some say the production title of this film, is Bad Cupcake, which is clearly meant to be a reference to Carl the Cupcake, Chica's faithful consumable companion. I say consumable because, well, Carl is a cupcake and I'm the faithful companion that isn't a food product. Well, unless you buy me dinner first. The title of the movie isn't actually Bad Cupcake. That's just the title they use as a way to protect the movie. So casting calls, booking locations, and all of that is done using the Bad Cupcake moniker. But considering it's the working title, I guess there isn't really going to be much significance with the plot. I don't think that Chica will be a key player in this, despite Susie seemingly already being cast. But it's probably just going to be like for a plot development thing, because she's been cast as Ghost Ch Kid number five. That's just like a way to push the story forward and probably pay homage to a character that unfortunately won't be making an appearance because I, I doubt that Carl the Cupcake is going to have like a big twist reveal. And also if you guys are excited for the FNAF movie be sure you hit subscribe because we're going to be talking about it whenever there are 10 things that we can then cover on a list. And it ain't cast. While a whole lot of the cast has been revealed so far, most notably of course being Matthew Lillard as William Afton and Josh Hutchinson as Mike Schmidt, there are to at least, well at the time of typing this, 13 total cast members officially on the IMDb, and a 14th that had the film on their resume already. That secret cast member seems to be Jessica Blackmore, who you may know from My Name is Vivian or Monsters of Man, who ironically played a TV reporter on Five Days of Memorial, which I find hilarious, because it's Five Days of Memorial, and then now their resume has them listed as Mike's mom. You know, Five Days at Memorial, Five Nights at Freddy's, it's kind of, uh, they happened at the same time. The rest of the cast is Elizabeth Lale, Mary Stewart Masterson, Kat Connor Sterling, Josephia Love, Grant Feely, Piper Rubio, Asher Colton Spence, Lucas Grant, Joseph Polquin, Christian Stokes, and David Houston Dotty as of writing the video. Um, I guess I think a couple more have since been revealed. And apparently, Mike P. Sullivan is in the movie as well, according to his Facebook page. And it's seven, Fountain Fight. Leaked set footage, or possibly just set footage, depending on your definition of leaked, shows a scene where Mike is punching someone in a fountain. Or at least he was he was punching the water in the fountain since the camera angle kind of made the second actor unnecessary. Plus, why would you hold someone underwater to punch them if you don't need to? But nevertheless, we know that there is a fight in a fountain in what is most likely a mall. This probably takes place closer to the beginning of the movie and could be the catalyst for Mike needing to find a new job, which would bring him to Freddy Fazbear's, but that's currently speculation. It's also been reported that apparently the scene is caused by someone tackling Mike into the fountain or the other way around, with Mike tackling someone into the fountain. While a child also screams for their dad at the same time, which is probably the one that Mike is beating to a pulp. My guess would be that this kid and father were arguing, or that the child wasn't listening, and Mike, due to his previous trauma from the bite of 83, saw this as an attempted kidnapping, which made him spring into action. I'm assuming that this is after 1983, since I don't even think that a mall would hire a teenager as a security guard, and at this point, Michael would also have no reason to have this intense of a reaction until after the bite of 83. And at 6, FNAF World Reference. In this mall, there were also photos of an ice cream shop, which some people thought was Mike's job before security. However, I think security guard to night guard at Freddy's makes more sense than ice cream shop to security guard to night guard. Uh, you know, this isn't like Ant-Man after all. Mike isn't going to be working at Ben and & Jerry's and then don a springlock suit to become a superhero. Uh, but the name of the ice cream shop is creatively Ice Cream Parties. 
because, you know, I'm surprised it's not ice cream parlor. And while it could have been a Chica themed joint, it's not because, you know, copyright within the universe. It's also not in the style of any stores from the Pizza Plex, so it's not going to be taking place there. But it does feature Chica's magic rainbow from FNAF World as its mascot. It's not really anything deeper than that. Uh, it's just a reference to FNAF World, which honestly I, I love, okay? Like out of all the things to reference, FNAF World is probably one of the most interesting things that they could have, since after all, the clues from FNAF 3 on how to get the good ending are put in place because of FNAF World. So it's already a meta game within the FNAF universe, and now it's being referenced in the movie. So maybe th this is a bigger detail than we could even consider right now. Yeah, time for the FNAF cinematic universe. Can't wait for the Avengers, which is just ultimate custom night. Halfway through it at number five, Golden Freddy. Since the beginning of FNAF, the dawn of time, it seems, we have been wondering about the mysterious and seemingly supernatural entity of Golden Freddy. This entity that's able to travel through solid doors and walls, who causes us to have hallucinations, and crashes our game when they kill us. Who was this mysterious being? Over the years, we've gotten a few names, most notably with the gravestone ending in FNAF 6, but even with that ending, Golden Freddy's name had always eluded us. And if they are the one you should not have killed, or even if they aren't, the name wasn't given to us in Ultimate custom night either. Only an alias. But alas, we were finally saved in this one thing, everything else got messed up, but we were finally saved when the survival logbook came out, where after jumping through more hoops than poodles at a dog show or dolphins at SeaWorld when they just want food, we uncovered the name of Cassidy, thanks to wrong numbers on various pages somehow becoming coordinates in the goddamn word search. Uh, it was all out for a name reveal uh, that honestly didn't really mean much to the series since the name of Cassidy only appears in one other place and that was the novel, The Fourth Closet, um, and the character is of little consequence otherwise. And considering how Scott scrapped a Cassidy screenplay, I, I doubt they're going to have much significance in the movie, but I still want to see Golden Freddy. It's, it's, it's an iconic thing. In it for Vlad. Now, I know at least the vast majority of comments seem to think that the Immortal and the Restless series is like a linchpin in FNAF that proves that Afton killed his wife and what her name is supposed to be, but that's still highly unlikely. The Immortal and the Restless has never popped up again after this location, and if it was important, it would have. There has never been another instance of that show having any significance other than just being something we turned on to watch after work in Sister Location. It didn't reveal the mother's name, it didn't reveal that Afton never wanted a son, uh, because if that was the case, he would never have wanted Crying Child, so why would he have sworn to put him back together? And if he didn't want Michael, why would he have sent him down to get Elizabeth? It, it just doesn't make sense, okay? The Immortal and the Restless is, is something that shows up less often in the series than the name Jeremy, and we don't think that that name has any additional significance. Plus, I don't know about you, but I'm, I watch The Flash, and I can't run at super speed, so... Uh, yeah, it doesn't reflect your personal life. So basically, I just I want the show to appear on a TV in one scene so that we can see Vlad, and I don't know, maybe have like someone at a Comic Con sign like the voice actor for Vlad at a Comic Con. That'd be funny. I want to see that. That's the version. Getting close to the end, in number three, Mangle. I'm gonna be straight with you. You're gonna be mad, but I'm gonna say it. We don't know who caused the bite of 87 still, or in reality, who the bite of 87 was actually on. I mean, we have theories about it. We have the theory that it was Mangle, or that it was Freddy, or maybe Chica that bit Jeremy, but theories do not equal fact. This incident has been on our minds since the first game, and we haven't been able to come up with a definitive and confirmed answer. So, yeah, I want this to happen. <laughs> if you ask me, that's almost certainly something that needs to be explained. It's been eight years, and we still haven't gotten an actual direct answer. And if anything, we've gotten conflicting answers. Originally, we thought it was Mangle, but then the handprint on Freddy's face seemed to kind of indicate that it was him. And then in Ultimate Custom Night, we got the line of where's my beak lodged in your forehead, of course, which made us think that it could have been Toy Chica. But we have no real answer, despite what I know you've already written in the comments. Yeah, I. I I know that you're all angry, okay? You're all typing out and yelling at me, but come on, okay? It's not confirmed and it's not canon. Unless Scott clearly says that Mangle caused the bite, all we have is theories. So, I'm desperately hoping that Mangle shows up in the movie so that we can have it explained. Please! For the love of God, especially if it's going to have the first three games and FNAF 2 is, has Mangle in it, so just do it, please. And ultimately, in a number two, Circus Baby. Hello and welcome to Miss Mojo. Today we're counting down the top 10 worst anime betrayals, but it's FNAF. Uh, I'm gonna keep making that joke every single goddamn time. 
Maybe next time I'll say top 10 anime. In Sister Location, we thought that we finally had the first actually decent animatronic. Someone that was trying to help us, like a prototype glam rock Freddy. But that wasn't true, all right? <laughs> Baby was giving us tips on how to survive. She was helping us get through Ballora's gallery. She really seemed like she wanted us to live. But then, what do we get for trusting her? Scooped and stuffed. Like we were just the, the, the family pet turkey around Thanksgiving. It, it was probably one of the most brutal things to happen to a character in the entire series, and it's all because we trusted Baby. She made us feel safe, she gave us confidence, prevented us from getting killed, only to use our body as a skin suit, then get kicked down and entered not even a game later. God, almost as bad as my ex. This is why I don't trust Glamrock Freddy though, all right? The baby is legit one of the reasons that I have trust issues, and that's saying something. And finally, in at number one, the puppet. The puppet is an animatronic puppet and a major antagonist, but also a good guy in a way in the FNAF series. They first appeared as the seemingly kind of like implied main antagonist of FNAF 2, but in the later games, they were showing their heroic side. It was like a Regina from Once Upon a Time arc. It serves as the prize vendor of the newly refurbished Freddy Fazbear's of 1987, and it's actually implied that they were originally from Fredbear's family diner, or at least its inspiration was. After the pizzeria was only open for a few short weeks, it was forced to close down, but the puppet, unlike the other toy animatronics who were scrapped due to possible malfunctions, was not scrapped, later appearing in the newer pizzeria from the first game, as evident by the dream cutscenes, as evident by the dream cutscenes from Sister Location, and appearing as Lefty in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Lefty was an animatronic that was intended to capture the puppet, and it's actually an acronym um, because it was possessed by Charlotte and Henry, who was her father, wanted to capture the souls so that they, he could then release her. <sighs> but overall. The puppet has significance to the story, and plus, have you seen the way that it walks around in FNAF 2 VR before it jump scares you? That's creepy as hell, that needs to be in the movie.